Uh, evening, ladies and gents. My name is Simon Brown, doing this evening's presentation. So this evening, we're looking at finding value. We're looking particularly at the Benjamin Graham methodology. We will delve into what it is. We will delve through the JSC and see what, if anything, pops up. Uh, and then we will talk about some of the frailties and problems that existed in that process. Uh, Benjamin Graham himself is genuinely considered the, the, the father of value investing. Um, he taught at Columbia. He's written a number of books. The best known is probably The Intelligent Investor, which he wrote, and then uh, The uh, Securities Analysis, which he wrote with David Dodd. Uh, it's intelligent Investor is probably the better of the two because he's smart about that point. He's 15 years down the line. It is, however, a difficult book to read. I mean, it is, you've got to read it with a glass of water. It is the driest book you are going to encounter in your entire life. And at the end of it, I mean, you know that you're smarter, but you're not sure if the pain was quite worth it. Nonetheless, if you if you really want to, it's probably worth it. Uh, they're both great books, but certainly uh, Intelligent Investor. It's considered the classic of value investing as, as, as a concept. Um, Many will tell you that Warren Buffett is a value investor. He is not. He used to be. He studied under Graham, uh, and in fact, and he 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 worked with 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 Graham way back in the early 50s. Before eventually he bought Berkshire Hathaway, which was a failing uh, textile business, and obviously we now know Berkshire Hathaway these days. But probably, but early in the 70s, uh, he pivoted into what would best be defined as GOP, growth at reasonable price, and that's broadly the, the, the strategy which I look at in my investing and probably which most of you are doing at the same time. You're looking for those companies that are growing really, really well, but you want to be careful of what you pay for them. In other words, you don't want to pay 400 bucks for Aspen uh, because that, uh, hindsight, is not a great idea. But you want to find the right company and then you want to find the right price to pay. And that broadly, and that is pretty much what Phil Fisher's strategy, and he wrote the book, and he actually wrote it in the 50s. I was unaware. I actually thought he wrote it in the 70s. His Common Stocks and Uncommon Profits, which is an infinitely more readable book. You don't need a glass of water next to you. Um, and in, in all the cases, although these books are in excess of 50 years old, the, the theories, the concepts, etc., behind them are still applicable and still well worth it. So if you want some reading, start with Common Stocks, Uncommon Profits. And if you've got lots of water on your bedside table, you can go read uh, uh, Intelligent Investor. I have honestly never read Security Analysis. I haven't got to that point yet. Um, so Graham was the classic value investor. He, he defined the genre uh, value investors these days in South Africa, and there are few of them. I mean, every investor wants value, of course. It's how we define it. And very much in the senses of the classic value, um, people such as, as Pete Fulon, uh, the chap at Investec, um, and Adrian Seville from Canon, et cetera, et cetera, are very much your value investors. The trick with value investing is it's a very lean place for a long time and then suddenly it gets exciting and you make your money. What we also have these days are ETFs, which are value methodology ETFs, which then apply uh, value methodologies in order to the entire basket of shares. Um, July 2014, I did a presentation on, on this exact same topic. So we almost five years ago, the video is online. You can go and find it. It turns out 25,000 people have watched me spend an hour, come to the end and say there are no stocks that meet the requirements. Not a one. 25,000 people have been deeply disappointed. Um, the good news is, I, I, I will, uh, spoiler alert, I did find some stocks. So at the end of this presentation, there will be some shares. Um, so I'm not going to take you all down that same path. And the reason why I then decided to redo it and come back again this year was, well, because, hey, we're five years later. And in those five years, our stock market has gone nowhere. So, hey, earnings up, price the same, maybe we got some value lurking, let's come and revisit. Uh, yeah, okay, the theory is good, the practice not necessarily always exactly. So, Graham talks around two types of value, defenses versus, versus enterprise. Um, and there are the particular chapters if you want them. In essence, your, your defensive really is just a portfolio that runs itself. Uh, it's going to be 10 shares equal weighted into it. We'll go through the methodology of selecting those shares in a moment. Um, and then you pretty much get those 10 shares. And it sort of goes along and happens. And you're broadly going to get market returns. Of course, these days, if you want market returns, you buy an index tracker. But back in the 30s and 40s, I mean, index trackers only arrived 
in, in the U.S. in the 70s uh, with with Jack Bogle, and and as ET, you know, and and more more widely available in the 90s and locally in December of 2000. So the idea of average market returns is like, well, yeah, that's what an ETF is for. His enterprise one is therefore much more aggressive. It's 20 stocks that need to be managed. You need to be monitoring. You're potentially going to be exiting stocks, entering new ones, et cetera. Makes it, <coughs> excuse me, much more attractive in the sense that it's a little more active. And, and, and folks are giving up their Thursday evening to come hear me speak are, are comfortable with that. Um, you know, this, you know, if, if you're like uh, ETFs are all I need, well then that that's perfectly fine. But there's more active into the process, and the theory being is that you will get better returns from it. <coughs> you get a basket of 20 stocks, each stock weighted 5%, um, and if you're picking right, you get those better returns from it. Um, so let's delve into. I'm going to go into each of them. We can run through. We can get the methodologies. We can see where it works. One important point, he excludes property stocks and he excludes holding companies. Holding companies, because quite simply, go and buy the underlying companies. Now, in some instances, and let's look at uh, African Rainbow Capital, Patrice Masepe's business, you know, many of those underlying businesses we as private investors can't invest into. We can't go buy a stake in A2X. We can't go buy a stake in Rain and many of the other businesses that are available. Um, but in terms of, of, of the methodologies, they don't see through to the actual companies sufficiently well. So uh, the holding companies, no. Um, and property stocks, just by the process of what property companies are, how they work, a, a, a retail investment trust and the like, they're just not geared. They're not going to pop up on the screens at all. They're just not going to happen in that sense. So those are excluded from that selection process. So let's go into some details. There is a risk this evening. I just lose my voice, and I have no plan for if that happens. <laughs> Actually, I'm poor. You, my plan. Nope. <laughs> Christia offered to fly down, but she hadn't seen it either. So the details for defensive is you want large, stable companies, which is, I mean, what is a large, stable company? In truth, I'm doing it on market capitalization, and I'm saying a 10 billion are market capitalization which is about 90 companies on our JSC uh, out of 400 and 450 or so. 10 billion is fairly chunky. I call those large caps. Between sort of 2 and 10 is your mid and under 2, maybe under a billion are going to be your, your small cap stocks. But that is, those are fairly chunky. Why chunky? Simply a, a business that has grown to 10 billion has got more track record to it, has probably got more revenue to it, has got more processes. It is a 10 billion rand business. It is a big business. You don't suddenly become a big business overnight. If you multi-choice, you list and suddenly you're a 50 billion business. But multi-choice started life as Mnet in the 80s and has grown over a, a 40 year period to get to that point in life at, at, at the moment. So that gives you your, your larger, your typically more stables. What's important there is that we're not going to pick up the next, oh, I need to upgrade all my examples. The example I was going to say is we're not going to pick up the next EOH at 10 bucks a share. Of course, you can pick up the next EOH at 10 bucks a share in about two weeks' time. And what I was saying by that is, you know, is, is Adapt IT, IT Sabu Shabalala's business, is that the next, adapt, uh, the next EOH is not going to pop up in here. We need it to already be at a level of size and, and growth. And, and, and uh, Graham talks about this in his book, and he talks about the small stocks, and his answer is quite simple. He has no interest in them. He says, my risk reward in those is deeply skewed. Yes, some of them make me a fortune. Most of them don't. And I can get superior returns with lower risk levels in this part of the market. And he's wrong. But I mean, and it's not me calling him wrong. The data is quite simple. Your small and mid cap stocks over the long term deliver better returns than your large cap stocks. Uh, but it is a very, very bumpy ride in the process. Um, and over the last 10 years has been a horrendous ride because they also, particularly in our South African example, those are the businesses that are much more exposed to the local economy, whereas your larger companies are much more national. Yeah, the top 40 60%, 65% of the profits of the top 40 companies come from beyond the borders of South Africa. In the mid-cap space, 80% of those profits come from within the borders of South Africa. So you've got, and, and, you know, and, and we know what's happened in South Africa in the last 10 years. You can ask anyone except former President Zuma, who apparently was not here during those 10 years. 
So large market capitalization, 10 billion. Uh, you need strong financial statements. And the beauty of Graham is he doesn't, you know, he says that, but then he tells you exactly what he means by strong financial statements. He wants current assets, twice current liabilities. So that's called a current ratio. And he wants it better than two. What are current assets and liabilities? We find those in the balance sheet. Current assets are assets, in other words, they're good things, they have their money for you that will that that that, that are going to be realized into cash within a 12-month period. So they will be cash in the bank. They will be inventories. They will be credit you have extended to some of your customers who are then going to pay back because they don't have you know more than 360 day terms, probably significantly less. So that is assets which are either cash or very easily turned in and very quickly turned into cash. So nice and liquid. Current liabilities are the same, except of course they are the liabilities. They're money that you owe to your suppliers. They're debt that is expiring in the short term. They are a bank overdraft, as an example. So those are liabilities that are then due in a, within the next 12 months. And the reason why this is an important number, and a number that I always look at, is that in theory, if your current liabilities are significantly more than your current assets, you could run into a squeeze here. Now. Buffett's letter came out just two weeks ago, or maybe yeah, two weeks ago, his annual Berkshire Hathaway letter came out. And if you read it, he talks about the, the Russian roulette nature of debt. And what he says is debt is great. Debt is wonderful. Debt is leverage. Debt grows your business. And it's truly wonderful until it's not, and then it's a bullet in the head, and then it's game over. And we've seen that with a number of companies locally who've had to do significant rights issues, who've been completely overwhelmed by their debt, one of them, which hasn't yet done the rights issue, is Tongard, um, who who being killed by a number of issues, but by massive debt on their balance sheet. When everything was booming, that debt didn't matter. Now things aren't booming, and it does matter. And, and I flew in this afternoon, and I had a window seat, and you look out the window, and we, we landed from Durban towards the airport. And you fly, and it's all just that sugarcane is all just land waiting to be converted into money, except they can't. Yeah, uh, and, and they can't do it just because of the economy. I mean, last year they sold one hectare. I'm pretty sure we could club together ourselves and buy a second hectare and we would have doubled their land sales. But that debt on their balance sheet is putting them under significant pressure. And they're going to have to do a rights issue. And the problem is, is that when everything was smiling, the share was 140 rand. And you do a rights issue at 140 rand, no worries. But now the share is 30 rand. And you do a right session, you basically got to give away four times as many shares. It's four times as dilutive doing it at this part of the process. So that's why your current assets versus liabilities, in the good times, no one cares. In the bad times, it's hugely important, but it should always be important. And then he wants working capital greater than, than long-term debt. Working capital is, in essence, current assets, less current liabilities. In other words, that money which is, which is yours and within the business, which you're using for the operational processes of the business, which don't have other calls on it. There are day-to-day -day running costs to run any business. In retail, it's going to be your, 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 your stock on the shelf, your stock in the warehouse, uh, and, and credit that you have given some of your customers if you give credit to customers. Um, and in essence, that is going to be largely your working capital. And he wants that to be greater than long-term debt. He wants positive earnings with no losses in the last 10 years. That's not unreasonable. I mean, so what you're getting here is that you what, what you're not getting here is startup businesses, which is pretty much the 10 billion solves that problem largely. But you're also getting businesses that are not cyclical in nature. In other words, that and let's take platinum as an example. You know, four years ago the platinum miners couldn't make money like anywhere. I mean, like if they found money in the street and they try to pick it up, they'll probably fall and break their nose and not get to it. Now suddenly they're printing cash. But during that process, and yes, the share prices have done incredibly well, and Platts I think is up 400% since its lows of last year. However, if you roll back 10 years ago, and Platts is about 80% off the highs of 10 years ago, and they've done rights issues in the meantime. And he's just saying, you know what, that stuff is messy. Let's just stay away from it. So no losses in the last decade. He goes on, he wants dependable dividends. He wants 20 consecutive years of dividend payments. Now, there is an argument to be made. I, I've been working on this with some folks on Twitter, and I'll, I'll show their details, Alicia Sicha and others. I'll give their details in a bit. Um, and some of the folks are saying, yeah, you know, 20 consecutive is a lot of 
dividend payments. I mean, firstly, it would exclude if we were doing this in the US, it would exclude Apple uh, because 20 years ago they were almost bankrupt. It would exclude Google because uh, 20 years ago they were a website no one had heard of. Um, it would exclude Amazon because 20 years ago they were almost bankrupt, et cetera, et cetera. So it excludes a lot. That said, 20 years of dividend payment, if we're going back to that point there and you want large, stable companies, what indicates stability more than 10 years of no losses and 20 years of dividend payment? It absolutely does. And oddly enough, that was not the big problem in terms of finding companies that qualified. Uh, it wants growing earnings, wants a 33 increase in earnings per share over the last 10 years, not per year over that period. So that's actually a fairly modest uh, 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 increase in earnings that he's looking for. <coughs> Excuse me. The debate here is 10 years, um, and there's a good argument to be made that actually you could drop that down to five or seven, which is more in sync with an economic cycle. Certainly on the JSC, and I know Adrian Seville from Canon has done the research, that if you look at, at, at the sort of cycles, if you're taking a seven-year period, pretty much you've covered a cycle. And by extending that period, you're not in any way improving the quality of the data. So we could certainly take a increase over a, ten, a seven year period instead of a, a, a 10. And, and really 33% over that period is not a giant number by any stretch of imagination. So that certainly is easy enough. He wants moderate price earnings ratio, three year average less than 15. 15 is about the, no it's not. 15 would be in the low side average. So our top 40 average is probably closer to 16, maybe 17. Uh, so 15 is a little on the light side in that sense. At this point in our market, however, 15 is probably what our top 40 is on. In fact, our top 40 might be a little bit even below that. So I'm certainly quite comfortable with that. Low price to book value. So book value is your net asset value. Of the business. In other words, if you liquidate a business, on the one hand, you have all the assets, you turn those into cash by you know getting rid of your inventories, etc. etc., you turn it into cash. On the other side, you've got liabilities, you clear all the liabilities, you pay your debts, you get rid of all of that, you've got a pile of cash left over. That's a, the, the net asset value of the business, the breakup value of the business. And if you divide it by number of shares, you get net asset value per share. Uh, what that then tells you, so book value, net asset value, the interchangeable mean the same thing. Companies will trade at a premium to that because you're not buying a business to break it up. You're buying a business for the profit over the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Just quick, if I can quickly tangent onto a side, Sasfin has a net asset value of about 48 Rand. It's currently trading at 30 odd rand and change. Had a really good trading update yesterday. Historically, when you've bought that share where net asset value was 1.1, in other words, it was trading 10% above net asset value, it then lifts up to one and a half, so you get about a 40% increase. But over the same period, you get dividends, which add about another 10% to your return because your holding period is about 18 months. And then your last kicker is that over that period, your net asset value increases, so you get an extra kicker on top. So in theory, Sasfin is one of the most attractive looking shares on the market. And I would caveat by saying I said that a year ago, it was 45 Rand, and now it's 35 Rand. Um, and that was based just on, it's the beauties of, of the print. Right? You say something on TV, no one remembers a word. You write something in Finweek, some oak out there mails you every week. You said this, it's like, yeah, but I said it only a month ago. Give it time, give it time. Lots of it. So he wants a price to book should be 1.5. In other words, if the NAV is 10, he wants the share to be 15 or lower. He doesn't want to pay extreme multiples, which immediately slices out all those high growth acquisitive companies um, that we have on our market. So the EOHs would not qualify because they were, you know, that they never had a price to book of 1.5. Um, a lot of our big banks don't qualify. Excuse me, their price to books are currently running closer to around 1.6, 1.7, or there's about. And that's, that's not a, I don't think that's a massively onerous number. He's got, if you read the, the other one, the security analysis book, he actually talks about trying to pick up stocks that are trading at 0.8 of net asset value. In other words, if the breakup value is 10 Rand, you pay 8 Rand for the share. 
which was brilliant in theory, but I have been caught almost every time I have tried that, it has ended in tears. Uh, Don Group, net asset value, 80 cents. Share, 30 cents. Simon's exit price, zero. Um, Goodison, uh, net asset value, 135. Share, 85 cents. Delisting, a buck and 10. Um, Argent, for a decade, Argent has been trading at 40, 50% below net asset value, and it just doesn't change. The question is, can they realize that value? And oftentimes, instead of it being value, it is value trap. And that distinction between the two is not something I have been able to master, is the honest answer. You know, Don Group, to me, they owned all their hotels. They owned land, prime land, and Santon and Rosebank, and all of this. And the land is worth more than the market cap, and the whole thing just collapsed in a heap. So, yeah, I, yeah. Sorry, Sam. Uh, but Benjamin Graham supported that Sikar Park stock yeah so he did a he, he did a lot of that um, particularly late 30s and into the 40s during the world war etc etc so he would actively hunt out businesses that were trading below breakup value markedly below breakup value and either one of two things become an active investor in other words go in there and kick some button try and make things happen or just you know basically liquidate the business um, and he would pick up chunky stakes you know he would pick up you know like like get a 40 odd percent holding in it and then basically liquidate it and then make his profit from that way out the, the difference that we have today I think in terms of the liquidation so in terms of the fixing it up and making it work uh, sure there are obviously challenges the trick with liquidation and we have seen it time and time again is that the big lenders you know, they've got, say, a liability of a billion rand, and they're like, yo, if this company goes bust, we lose a billion. Why don't we do a rights issue and give them another half a billion, and hopefully they won't go bust? So what we see is a lot of those companies, which back in the day would simply have gone to the wall, are being saved because the lenders look at it as the lesser of two evils. And, and there's lots to debate around that, and certainly it, it closes a, a loophole. Uh, it's probably not how capitalism how Adam Smith was thinking when he was talking around capitalism, but it is what it is. I mean, that's just how it operates. Not much we can do with that. So now we have all of this. I head off to my uh, website where I then go and do a search. So the beauty of my uh, online uh, uh, platform is I can then say, show me all the shares that meet this criteria so I don't have to go and do this manually because, uh, yeah, there's hours in the day. So the first thing I'm doing, I'm looking for a price to net asset value of below 1.5. P.E. ratio below 15. I want uh, P.E. ratio above zero because if the P.E. ratio is negative, they're losing money. So above zero to show me that they're profitable. Dividend yield above uh, zero because, again, I need 20 years of dividends, so they have to have paid it. And a market capitalization of 10 billion. So that's not giving me everything, but that narrows me down from 400 plus to 20 shares. And at that point, I almost cried into my tea. I don't drink tea. It would have been coffee. Um, because 20 shares, I need 10. The defensive portfolio wants 10 stocks. And of those, uh, we've got properties. Where's my properties? Uh, Into is a property. Uh, EPP is a property. GTCSA uh, and uh, Redefine REIT is a property. So in truth, you've only got 16. And HCR is a holding company. So it got very tearful very, very quickly. But I was quite excited by some of the stocks that we were seeing here. So I thought, cool, we've got a pile of shares. Let's run through it. So what you then do, <coughs> 20 years of dividends and 10 years of no losses actually then whoops that list down very, very quickly. And suddenly I'm down with five. Um, and a whole bunch of them. And part of it, South 32 just doesn't have... 10 years of history, never mind 20 years of history. They spun out of Billiton a couple of years ago. Uh, Remgro holding. Uh, so it, it very quickly, the list got a whole lot smaller. But still, we had five shares. And I thought, hey, five. Yeah, it's, it's five more than I had last time. So I was quite chuffed with five. But now we've got to go and crunch the next bits of numbers. Remember those current assets, twice current liabilities, current ratio of two, working capital greater than long-term debt. Uh, so we need to go and crunch further. So we pull them apart. British American Tobacco, 
Current assets, and these happen to be billions and they happen to be sterling, but that's neither here nor there. Current assets, 12.6. Current liabilities, 16. Ouch. Fails. It's just fails. The reason is they bought Reynolds. So they've got a chunk of debt on their balance sheet. And it comes back to the point I made a moment ago. I take that back. The point Warren Buffett made, and I uh, repeated a moment ago, around when times are good. And if you're looking at Kraft Heinz in the U.S., which 3G, the same peeps who bought SAB Miller via Anheuser-Busch. Um, and you look at their whole process and what's happened there, what they do is they buy a business and they load debt into in the purchase process. In fact, it's what happened with Edcon. You've got our own local story. And then they hope that they can get that, you know, extract efficiencies out of the business and quickly pay down that debt. And with Kraft Heinz, it hasn't worked. And with SAB Miller, it's not working either. The problem with SAB Miller is they paid a, they bought it at a PE of about 40 for a company that's growing at about 5% a year. Now, if you want to be generous, a company at 5% a year, you buy at a PE of 15. If you want to be kind, uh, you don't buy it in a PE of 40. So you massively overpay and you can't extract the synergies that you need to. So, I mean, you know, the first thing 3G do is like, okay, so there's, the, you know, everyone flies economy, everyone stays in motels, and everyone hires the smallest car that the car hire company has. But that only takes you so far. And if you just bought SAB Miller for like the biggest deal since forever, like that doesn't actually take you far enough. So I was surprised to see that with British American Tobacco, but then of course it struck me that they've done that Reynolds deal. Quick aside on tobacco, let's quickly go down a little bit of a rabbit hole. So British American Tobacco fails, it's off the list. The rabbit hole for British American Tobacco is quite simple. The whole advent of vaping has created problems in their life. And the problems are quite simple. So tobacco companies have been very careful to keep their head below the parapet and not create any regulatory problems. And what they're doing is basically two things. Firstly, they're focusing on premium brands, which they can sell for higher margin, and they're moving eastwards. Eastwards into Africa, eastwards into Asia, eastwards into China. And they're basically saying to North America, okay, yeah, you guys don't smoke, that's fine. Western Europe, yeah, that's fine. But hey, hey China, India, Africa, not a problem. But this vaping came along and they thought to themselves, ooh, here's our end. We can get back into America. We can get back into Western Europe and we can get the kids smoking again because these vaping things aren't bad, etc. And basically they lifted their heads above the parapets and they are in deep trouble because the regulators are coming. The regulators are deeply unhappy. And here's the stat. Matric students in America, the number of matric students who smoked in 2018 versus 2015 increased 300%. Now, they're vaping, but uh, the regulators are like, we don't actually care. The regulatory industry the world over, South Africa included, is saying, we don't care the mechanism of delivery, we care the nicotine. So suddenly, these tobacco companies have raised their heads above the parapets, and they are in trouble. The regulators are coming. They want to ban menthol in America. Truthfully, they want to ban flavored cigarettes, because those increase in smokers, every single new smoker, kids smoke flavor. I mean, I remember starting to smoke as a 17-year-old, and it was tough because that thing tasted terrible. If it had been strawberry flavored, it would have been much easier. So yeah, BTI is cheap. It doesn't meet the Graham, and frankly, I think the tobacco industry has a serious problem of their hands. Their own making. You know, killing your customers is never a good business strategy. <coughs> So then I got very excited by Sassel because I own Sassel and Lake Charles is finally over and they can start making money and they fail because I want current assets twice at current liabilities. I think that if we come back to Sassel in about a year, we'll actually find a much better number because there's a lot of current liabilities sitting in their balance sheet now that will wash out over the next year as Lake Charles goes live. And I think if we come back in a year, we'll probably find the current assets about the same-ish, but I think those current liabilities will be significantly lower. So SAS was definitely one to watch. I quite like it. I own it, and I have been buying it. But it didn't, it didn't pass the Graham test. ABSA, yeah, man, banks. Yeah, banks and insurers, they designed, they are, their sole purpose in life is to confuse. And they do it at every level. Right? When they're selling you an insurance policy, they make it confusing. When they're selling you a banking product, they make it confusing. And when they publish a set of results, they make it confusing.
So I couldn't find any of the data I needed from from ABSA on 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 on, on anywhere. And maybe it's a simple thing as current assets and current liabilities might not be banker lingo. I mean that that could actually make some sense. I I need to run that past some CAs. But ABSA failed because I just couldn't get the data. Hey. Yeah. It's going to be opposite. But I mean, I couldn't find anything. I mean, I ran through their balance sheet, and that you know, every other company is a simple. That, you know, they got a balance sheet, and it's like do 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 do. Current assets, total number, boom, take it, drop it, absolute. No. Do a control F, search current, and they talk about current accounts. They talk about current this, current that, but no current assets. So ABSA failed. MediClinic, I was very interested in MediClinic because you know what's happened to MediClinic. I have concerns around health stocks and the regulatory environment, and certainly the current assets weren't so bad, but their long-term debt. And this is what's been, again, MediClinic is another one. They have two problems. One is, you know, when everything was great, no one cares about debt, but things aren't great anymore. There's another issue with the medical fraternity broadly, and that issue is quite simply that around the world, medical costs have been running well ahead of inflation for decades, and governments are clamping down on it. And they're clamping down quite simply by saying, Healthcare is a human right. It's not a rich person's right, and therefore we're going to do something about it. We've seen it locally. Single exit pricing at, 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 at uh, ph pharmacies, the, the NHI bill, we've seen it globally. A clamp down on medical. So there's one space in the medical industry that you do want to be. Uh, there's a company called Stryker in the U.S., and there's others who make the equipment. They make the bed. They make the needle, they make those things, and they've still got a, a, a catch there. And what Stryker does, I think it's Stryker, the company that basically sells you a robot that does surgery, I know, like, I, there are scary things, and then there's a robot doing surgery. What could possibly go wrong? And what they do is they charge you a royalty fee for every, oper every surgery that you do, and what they do is they just program more surgeries, so one day you get to work, and now your robot can do a new surgery. <laughs> I'm busy that day, but anyway. So uh, MediClinic failed because their working capital is uh, is not uh, the, the short-term debt. So long-term debt is just simply too big. And then Barlow World, and by now I'm getting desperate. So look, their current assets are not twice their current liabilities. <laughs> but what's a couple of billion between friends? I mean, we can afford them a few billion. We can pretend that that number is actually 15 and not 17 and a half, right? We can spare them two and a half billion because their working capital is more than their long-term debt. And bingo, Barlow World is the only one that came through on the defensive portfolio. But there's one final step we need to do. So we've now got Barlow World. All the others failed. 400 plus stocks. We've got one that's left. We now need to do what's called the Graham number. We take headline earnings per share. We multiply it by book value per share times by 22. And we get the square root. And you want that number to be higher than share price. Barlow World, 127. Square of 22 and a half. Heps was 18.32. Book value is 104. Comes out at 207. Graham will tell you Barlow World is worth 207. And you can currently buy it for around 130. Barlow World qualifies as a defensive stock by the, 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 the Graham theory. And it is... It is deeply disappointing that only one share came up. But hey, we've still got enterprise, so there's more to look at. It's not all the end of the world. It's deeply disappointing that only one share comes up. What I really like with the process is it, 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 it helps us perhaps in our broader investment world to give some thought as to areas to look at as to what we should be concerning ourselves with. Things such as consistency of profit and dividend, things such as working capital, uh, things such as current ratios and short-term debt, uh, things such as uh, 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 book value and the like. And what that does more than anything is it stops us buying runaway shares. And when you say, what's a runaway share? Aspen at 440. That was a runaway share. What had happened was Aspen was, you know, there's no chance Aspen could carry on growing at 40% a year. Even if it could, 440, the stock was expensive, but it couldn't carry on growing at 40%, notwithstanding other problems that they had. But this sort of discipline, this sort of process, I think makes us better investors and makes us know you know, ideas of what to look at and where to look and some thought around it. And it's adaptable. I mean, of course it is. Uh, book value per share, so net asset value. 
uh, and he does EPS because they don't have HEPs because they have GARP. Yeah. So it's 22 and a half times earnings per share for the last financial year, which was 1823, times the net asset value of the share, in this case 104. As it is, I mean, Barlow World's net asset value is 104, and the price is 127. And in Barlow World, that 104 is a fairly solid net asset value. It's not smoke and mirrors. It's not uh, 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 goodwill and all of that sort of thing. It, it's a proper number. Um, so 20, the 22 and a half is constant. So that, that was Graham. And if you read the book, he talks around how we got to that number. Um, and that to him is the magic number. So all of that, and then you take the, the, the square of it and you get to 127. So he's saying that Barlow World is attractive at current price. So a lot of work, we got one share. And I don't own Barlow World, so I'm going to go do some digging on it. So only Barlow, we need to fudge it. But I mean, we fudged it only a little bit. The trick is, in theory, you want 10 stocks. But well, we didn't get 10, we got one. That's how it is. So let's go to Enterprise. Enterprise is supposed to be more aggressive, so it's a little more forgiving. We still want market caps of 10 billion, but a current ratio of only one and a half instead of two which was the previous example. We want long-term debt can actually be, uh, they're giving a little bit of flexibility in long-term debt. Uh, no losses in the last five years instead of 10. Uh, dividend next year, they don't mind about the historic dividend, they just want to say, is this company expecting to pay a dividend in the next financial year? They want HEPs to be more than it was five years ago. Instead of 33% more, they just want it to be more than it was. Uh, book Price to book, here they do get a little more aggressive. Instead of one and a half, they want 1.2, and they want PEs under 10 instead of under 15. So what they're doing in this methodology is it says we will be a little more flexible and a little more, no, not flexible, a little more generous in the initial process, and then we start to get quite aggressive on PE and, and uh, uh, price to book. So that companies that are perhaps newer, companies that are perhaps slightly less stable, but companies that are certainly Dividend next year means they've got some cash flow. Uh, HEPs greater than five years ago means they at least have done some growth in the last five years. Um, but then suddenly they get aggressive with the price to book and the PE ratio. So you're looking at slightly riskier companies, but you're wanting to buy them at even cheaper values. And that's managing your risk reward payoff in the sense. So again, I go off to my trusty website and I plug in the various different metrics and I get an answer of six. I thought 20 wasn't a lot. I got six stocks, um, <coughs> of which two of them are property. So I got four. One of them is a holding company. But I, I mean, HCI is difficult. Uh, anyway, I, we got four. <laughs> not terribly, not, not thrillingly thrilling, but at least we got some shares. So we run through and they all survive. We got Raynet, we got HCI, we got Afrox, and we got uh, Asor. They all survived in that they expect to pay a dividend next year, no losses over the last five years, and HEPs is bigger than it was five years ago. In other words, they qualify. So we got four stocks. So again, we run through the second part of the process, current ratio one and a half and 100%. So HCI just fails, current liabilities, current assets. Truthfully, I'm glad it failed because it's actually a holding company. And if it didn't fail, then I'd have to come up with a whole bunch of reasons why we would give it a pass. We don't give it a pass. It just fails. Sorry for you. No remark. Nothing. Go home. Come back. Arm um, passes. Left, right, and center. Current assets, way ahead of current liabilities. That's the beauty of single commodity. When the commodity booms, man, you're just printing it, and it all looks wonderful. Um, working capital, long-term debt. Everything here, nice, simple, arm um, passes. Uh, Afrox, same story. Uh, Long-term debt is more, but it's allowed to. He's happy to have 10% higher, so that's not a problem. Uh, current assets versus liabilities, well ahead. So absolutely, Afrox passes that process as well at the same part. So then we come back to the same number, except here it's 12 instead of 22 and a half. Afrox share price 100, you run it through, you come to 107. So not crazy, not the value of, of Barlow World, but offering some. And truthfully, in the enterprise section of, of, of this uh, uh, philosophy, you're not expecting to find giant discounts as we did with Barlow's. The, 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 the defensive process, you're looking for those stocks that are just like 
man, fair value is 220 and the stock's 110. You're looking for those giant sort of misprices. In the enterprise, you, you're going to find less mispricing because part of this is what it's saying is companies that are good but had tough times and coming out of those tough times. So it's not just sort of their normal operating procedure. They've got extra wind at their back for whatever the case may be. And in the cases here, it's quite simply, it's your PGMs. Um, and as a result of the PGMs, Afrox is selling more explosives. Interestingly, if I drop some of my criteria for size, Omnia pops up, which is broadly the same sort of business. Chemicals in use in explosives and chemicals in use of uh, 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 agriculture for fertilizer and the like. So if I, if, I, if I move my market cap to lower, Omnia pops up in replacement of, of, of Afrox. So at the end of the day, we end with three. We've got Barlow World. Uh, and then we've got Afrox, and then we've got uh, African Rainbow Minerals, which is, uh, and it, it gives us, uh, I'm surprised by the minor, but it's there and it gives us something to work with. We needed 20 stocks for that portfolio. So the short answer is, is I'd hoped to have a list of 30 shares this evening. In fact, I'd hoped to have a list of 45 shares, and we'll be arm wrestling over which ones to keep and which ones to throw out. Instead, I have three. So a little short, but you know what? I, I don't make the numbers. The, 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 the market makes the numbers. We just work with what we have got. What it tells us is that this methodology of Graham's is exceedingly strict. And what I think a lot of us, and I add myself into this, fall into is the loosening of our criteria. You know, I remember, and it's it's not quite analogous, but it'll work. I remember starting to trade in the late 90s and struggling to find a methodology. Um, and a chap on one of the forums I was on said, well, what are your favorite three technical analysis indicators or oscillators? I forget what they were, but I told him. And he said to me, well, what are the rules for those indicators or oscillators? You know, RSI cross up through 30 or down through 70, whatever the case may be. And I told him, and he said, well, there's your system. Just wait for those three to happen. And I was so excited. And I rushed off and I waited. And about two days later, I come back and I said, like, but dude, nothing's happening. Like, tick tock. And he's like, no, like, wait. Like, you might wait days, weeks, months, years, wait. And I'm like, I haven't got, I, like, I, I got a date this weekend, man. I need money. Like, like, you know, what's this? And I think... In the investing, for a bunch of reasons, we, we, you know, we, we come in wild and woolly and we know nothing. But then we get a bit smarter and we put some processes in place and we say, this is how we're going to do it. And this is going to be our structure and you've got to meet our criteria. And then we start to fudge those criteria for a bunch of reasons. Because Jean-Pierre Fuste goes on TV and talks eloquently about some brilliant stock that we had never thought of. And we look at it and it doesn't meet our requirement. But man, look at that chart. It's just going up and up. And we're not making money. And oh, so we bend. And what I like about this process is it takes us back to, 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 to solid, hard discipline. Which in truth, at its core, is what investing is about. Investing, you know, the, the problem with investing, and particularly these days, not so much when, when Gwen Graham was around, particularly in these days, the amount of information that's out there and the amount of commentary and, and people having their five cent views and, and stock tips here and there and everywhere. And I mean, we'd be just being bambo bamboozled left, right and center. And then in essence, almost trying to push us off our discipline. And this is not a private investor problem. This, this, is, this I, mean, I see this happening with the pros who, who manage other people's money, uh, unit trust managers and the like. I, mean, I, I was looking at a fund and you know, you're running your eye down and it's like, yeah, good stock, good stock. Good. Like, yo, why do you own that? And you know that this oak just had a rush of blood to the head and bought something and managed to justify it to his investment committee and now hopes that no one will notice. Because I've emailed him before and asked him about particular stocks, and he's replied. And I emailed him about this stock, and that was January, and I haven't heard a reply. And, and I've mailed him again and said, like, dude, like, like, can you help me here? And he's obviously embarrassed about it. He's like obviously wishing he hadn't had a rush of blood. And we have that as ourselves. Of course we do. We're human beings. What this does, I think it helps us focus. And, and I'm not suggesting that we all need to go and be Graham value investors, because if nothing else, you're only going to have three shares in your portfolio, and that's not enough for risk. But it does, 
it helps to highlight what processes and where we're missing out and, and, and what is important. Um, and it still does spit out some. So we're seeing some. So a couple of issues. So, so then I'm chatting. So, so let, let's just see, Sean. He's got a website as well. You can follow him on Twitter. I've been, he's been doing some work here, and I, I've, I've cribbed some of his notes. And, um, and there's some changes that we can make. So let's go back to when Graham was doing this. I mean, he had a market back then of 15,000 shares. And when he went in his size, and his size, I forget the value it was back then, because, of course, almost 100 years ago, you know, the, 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 the companies were smaller just because of inflation, et cetera. When he, his universe was 8,000 shares. So his problem was 8,000 shares. I, I, I only want to buy a couple. How do I? And so he, so he needed, he had a giant pool, and he needed to be humongously strict to try and get that 8,000 down to a manageable number of shares. And he states quite clearly, he has no desire to own hundreds of shares. And he's like, you know, it's, it's quite simply, like, you know, put your money on, take your chances, and, and have, you know, the courage of your conviction in a sense. Which is very much, which is why the, 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 the discipline and the, and, 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 and the strictness of it. There's also, quite simply, um, the, the market we've just come through at this moment with the incredibly low interest rates over the last decade, quantitative easing, et cetera, debt has been plentiful. So we have seen a lot of debt go onto balance sheets. British American Tobacco two years ago would have passed with flying colors. Whether the price would have qualified, not sure. But they bought Reynolds and that, that, that made them ugly and then suddenly they don't qualify anymore. So it's <coughs> perhaps also some of that. So... The big question is maybe 10 billion is just simply too high. That only gives us 90 stocks. There are 90 stocks in our market that are not property, that are not holders, holding companies, that have a market cap of over 10 billion. 90. That's not a big universe. That's not a big universe. Um, if we drop it to 5 billion, we get to about 125 stocks. Still not a very big universe. If we drop it down to 2 billion, we're starting to approach 200 stocks. And maybe the process is, and I haven't done it this evening because of time constraints and the like, maybe the process is to say, okay, let's be less strict on the 10 billion. Let's drop that to two. But let's, whilst we're going through the process, be very cognizant of the fact that we're letting some, for want of a phrase, riffraff into the room and we need to be careful of them. At, you know, let's be cognizant that we have lowered the barrier to entry, so the quality might not be there. So we need to be careful in that sense. Certainly, that does bring us more companies, and 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 and, and a significant number of them are still failing in that process. But it does bring us a lot more companies into it on market cap. And truthfully, the JSC. I mean, we look at the JSC as the most important exchange in the world. It's everything that matters. Blah blah. It is tiny. Uh, on global standards, it is tiny. You know, it's probably. A, a, a top 20 exchange in terms of size and everything else, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, if we compare it, so I mean, New York, so in, in Graham's day, there were 15,000 shares. Uh, they're now about 10,000 in the US, but, you know, they're 10,000. Man, oh man, do we even have 10,000 taxpayers in this country? So there's certainly, you know, it's, 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 it's universe size. I get that. So certainly to drop some there, uh, if you go to financehat.coza, there's a bunch there, and uh, Chairman Mo is what he calls himself on Twitter. If you go hit him up, he's got loads of ideas and thoughts, etc., on how it all works. Is that my timer, or have I done my steps? Yo, I did my steps. It actually turns out I cheat. You notice what I do? I do walk, right? But I wave a lot, too. <laughs> Fitbit's not clever enough to know the difference between a walk and a wave. <laughs> so I think I did uh, 6,000 steps and 4,000 waves, or maybe the other way around. Um, so hit him up, and I'm going to, so I'm going to take this, I, I, we'll put the video up on the, on the website, uh, I'll try to get it up this evening, or certainly over the weekend, um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go delve deeper, I'm going to go try the 2 billion, let's see what comes out of that. So uh, probably follow me on Twitter is going to be the easiest place, or drop me a mail and I'll send links, etc. I want to try and see if we can get deeper into that process. I have to say, I, I had expected to get more than three stocks. I really thought five years of sideways market, we would get more than, than three stocks that came out of it. Uh, the, 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 the biggest issue is, frankly, has been debt on balance sheets. 
and, and that doesn't surprise me. We, we have a lot of companies, not just locally, but globally, that are sitting with, with, with frankly, far too much debt on balance sheets, which is great until it's not. And when it's not, then it's usually... And, of course, Buffett takes it a step further. So he's like, the trick is, when everything goes pear-shaped, the executive gets fired but keeps all of his bonuses, et cetera, et cetera, and the shareholders are left carrying the can. 